We are uh, very, very lucky these days. It really is a, a new, new era in terms of uh, treating patients um, with cardiovascular disease and prevention, but also for secondary prevention. And if I can have my, neck, my slides up. Um, I'm really excited about this particular arena in, with regard to inflammation. Important for you to note my disclosures. I'm going to take you through the next 10 minutes on the inflammatory hypothesis, the evidence from the anti-inflammatory drugs, and the future perspectives and why I'm absolutely really excited about this arena. It's a novel pathway by which we've been probably ignoring for many, many years, and we already have some therapeutic regimens that is probably underutilized. So moving to this, we saw this slide by um, Dr. Um, Harrington. He showed us the tremendous decline, but that flattening in that end of the curve is what is really, really disturbing, and the fact that there is maybe and perhaps an uptick. And this is for coronary artery disease and myocardial infarction. If we go to 1955, the start of this curve, where we started to imagine this, Dr. Krupp, in the proceedings of the Rudolf Virchow uh, Medical Society, talks about the C-reactive protein in coronary artery disease. And there's even evidence about a decade before that with regard to the acute myocardial infarction where sedimentation rate, temperature, fibrinogen, and C-reactive protein was elevated. So this really is a marker that there is inflammation going on. And while in the past and currently, and we should continue to think about the traditional risk factors, diet, exercise, smoking, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, as modifiable and the non-modifiable ones with genetic predisposition and age, and of course, on top of sex-specific risk factors for women, which is completely under um, uh, appreciated with regard to pregnancy-related complications, polycystic ovarian disease, et cetera, as well as stress and anxiety and everything else that we've got going on, there is emerging risk with regard to inflammation that we need to think about. Why is it relevant in CVD? It plays a, a very important role in atherosclerosis development and progression. That inflammasome, the NLRP3 inflammasome that you see central here, I don't know if this is working out, yeah. um, is, and its chronic activation is pivotal for the cytokine production and that cascade of IL-1 beta, IL-6, uh, IL and then finally going into the liver and then the biomarker of C-reactive protein coming up and its association with vascular risk is tremendously important. These upstream regulators can be pharmacologically targeted. And of course, CRP is the downstream biomarker. In myocardial infarction, I think that concept is most relevant in my mind. Thinking about these stages and that concept of <clears throat> inflammation with that acute event, with the acute burst of inflama inf inflammation, PMN and monocyte recruitment, net formation, and of course, the cytokine cascade. That's usually then um, followed with this protection and healing process, that second phase with the, with the T cell and microphages protecting the healing, and then a residual low-grade inflammation that follows that is really, really interesting and important. And of course, these two can have important implications in clinical outcomes of our patients. And this concept with regard to the early burst and then the chronic phase and coming after those things with um, uh, targeted therapies is something that is very, very interesting and compelling to imagine. <clears throat> there is really good evidence that while LDL cholesterol reduction is incredibly important, and we're going to hear about that from Mark Banaka, where he talks about LDL and LP little a, in, in just a few minutes, it is also important to note that in 
the lowest LDL less than 70, it's the high inflammation that's driving a lot of these cardiovascular events. This is work from Paul Ritker, uh, where he looked at pooled analysis and really showed this. And this residual inflammatory risk, that concept and targeting that, of course, initiating uh, the best possible therapies up front, but then thinking about perhaps targeting these cytokines is something to think about. Now, you can also look at the work that we have done in our cath lab, and every single patient who comes to our cath lab has a C-reactive protein measured. We also have all of their cholesterol profile, and then long-term outcome prospectively in every patient undergoing PCI for the last 15 years. And if you look at this, you see this very, very important correlation of those patients who have persistent high level of residual inflammatory risk where they have a high C-reactive protein when they come in and it continues to be high. And also those who come in with a low level but then have a high level at, at, at follow-up. And this is a very, very important response that we published this. And then from this database, we were able to look at this for the effect of C-reactive protein after complex intervention in, in different BMIs, in CKD, in high bleeding risk patients, age and sex and diabetes, all of these correlating and all of these subgroups of patients undergoing PCI, all this work being published from our <clears throat> cath lab. What do we know about some of the anti-inflammatory studies? The roadmap for the development of anti-cytokine therapies have been going on for a very long time. If you think about this NLRP inflammasome and the first, you know, the IL-1, the IL-1 beta, very, very importantly, going after the microtubular with colchicine, there's been proven efficacy with two large-scale trials, COCOT with uh, AMI patients and LODOCO with stable coronary patients. And I'll show you these data. This is recent MI. Major reduction, about close to um, 23, a 23% reduction at 30 days after a myocardial infarction with colchicine and in stable coronary disease patients, most of them post ACS, again, a reduction with colchicine. And this is incredibly important that culminated to the ESC guidelines recommending this as a 2B recommendation that might be uplifted because just this last week we had another trial that showed very similar, uh, similar results and the FDA a year ago approving um, uh, the use of colchicine for, for these patients. But this roadmap continues and you understand and might remember the Canto study. This is an interleukin-1 inhibitor in canakinumab where there was proven efficacy in the Canto study. Large-scale study over 10,000 patients randomized to three doses of canakinumab compared to placebo, showing a very important benefit in terms of about four years, and Bob Harrington was very crucially involved with this trial, and he actually wrote a very, very important um, commentary because what this came out was a great result in the cardiovascular uh, side, but there was fatal infections associated with this. So use of these drugs does have some important safety issues that we need to think about. But if you look at Cantos, and look at the IL-6 um, measurements. Where did these patients had excellent results were in those patients who had a on-treatment reduction of their interleukin-6 levels. So it makes you think about maybe IL-6 could be an important target. Which patients today do we have important uh, evidence to treat them, those with known atherosclerosis, recurrent symptoms, progressive disease, high residual inflammatory risk with elevated C-reactive protein, but without any contraindications for colchicine, which is, of course, those patients who have serious kidney or liver disease, which limits the use for a lot of our complex patients. Where are we going in the future is in now coming even more downstream, going after the IL-6 ligand with ziltivicumab, which is a new 
IL-6 inhibitor that's under investigation on several trials. Targeting this in high-risk patients in the rescue trial was a of course, a small study, about 264 patients, they showed a significant reduction of inflammation and thrombosis in both CKD patients and high C-reactive protein um, uh, patients who had elevated CRP without any severe important safety issues. And as a result, this program by Novo Nordisk is taking off with Zeus, 6,200 participants, heart disease, CKD, and inflammation. In Hermes, with 5,600 patients, on those patients with heart failure of reduced or preserved ejection fraction and inflammation. And in 10,000 patients in the Artemis trial, with over 10,000 patients undergoing um, PCI for a type 1 MI. Zeus, as you could see here, is this double-blind placebo-controlled trial of high, high C-reactive protein patients with CKD. All participants have been enrolled. We're in the follow-up phase. And as you could see for AMI, we're really going after that target of the acute burst and then a chronic, um, chronic therapy. And this concept is one of the things that's been already evaluated in some of the smaller studies with anakirna and of course looking at the IL-6 from canakinumab. And as a result, the Artemis trial, a randomized parallel double-blind placebo-controlled uh, outcomes trial is now, will be enrolling the very first patient at the end of this month. Uh, Dr. Bott is on the, on the steering committee of this, um, steering executive committee of this trial with me, with many, many other fantastic leaders. I co-chair this with uh, Dr. Adrian Hernandez. The trial for the first time is being run by Novo Nordisk and Duke Clinical Research Institute, 10,000 patients. We're really looking forward to have many, many patients enrolled from our region with a diverse patient population. These patients will receive a loading dose of 30 milligrams sub-Q of ziltavicumab, followed by a chronic dose of 15 milligrams subcutaneously once monthly. So the future is bright. We're looking at novel therapies. You could stop getting tired about antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapies, but although there are factor 11 studies that are ongoing, that will be yet another target for us to imagine. Thank you so much for your attention.